We're going to start singing music this morning with While Shepherds Watch Their Flock. That's if I hit the right button. <laughs> Does everybody get music? That's also out front by the offertory uh, basket. Oh, you got the last one. Here. Sorry, Sam.
service outside. <laughs> it's chilly out there because normally Michigan people like me, you know, this is <laughs> tough stuff. Say, hey, Merry Christmas. Merry We're close, close, get closer, get closer. Yeah. And we've been talking about the characters of Christmas, talked about Zechariah, Elizabeth, talked about Mary and Joseph. Today we're going to talk about the shepherds. Next week we're going to talk about angels. And then we're going to talk about Jesus on Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve, I'll get information there to you. They're going to email some stuff to you in terms of our address and all that kind of good stuff for the worship service. So I want to start off with a Chinese proverb this morning, since we're all into quoting China lately. Uh, it goes like this. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. A journey with, of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Sounds pretty good to get the couch potato off the couch and get him going and a motivational kind of thing. However, it's rather useless. 
If you have no place to go, I have to take that first step. You got to go somewhere, you got to have purpose, you got to have a plan. In order to take that first step, something has to happen. Otherwise, you get nowhere, actually. In fact, there was a study done in 2009 by the Max Planck Institute for Biological Cybergenetics. I just read that title, make myself look smart. <laughs> anyway, here's what they did. They took some people and they put them in a forest uh, and at night or in, at dusk with no visible signs, no mountains, nothing, and they just told them to walk in a straight direction until they will reach their goal. And they did the same thing with people in the desert at night. No visible signs of any kind, the darkest desert, and they said, start walking straight and you will find your goal. Then tell them the goal, then tell them where they were going, just, just start walking straight and you'll find the goal. They found out that after a short time, people simply returned to where they started. In other words, they just walked in circles. They even did it with blind people, blinded people. And they said, we're going to blind you and we want you to walk in a straight direction. And so they started watching the people as they were blinded and walking in a straight direction. As about 66 feet into their walk, they started turning into a circle. The picture here is what they found out is the following. Without a visual guide, people would wind up, would wound up giving back, going back to where they started. Without a visual guide, they wound up going back to where they started. When I read that, I thought of the Christmas story. Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem. They had a spot to go to, wound up in a stable. The shepherds left their fields and went to Bethlehem, to the stable. The wise men followed the star from far off lands to the place where Jesus was. By the way, Jesus at that point was at a house. If you read scripture in Matthew, he wasn't at the state, wasn't in the manger seat, he was at a house. So I always tell people this time of year with your manger scenes in your home, you've got shepherds there, right? Mary and Joseph there and wise men, put them at the front door. <laughs> they never went to the stable. Okay, just a little sidebar for you. So, so, so what's the picture? The picture is, in fact, I've been thinking that with the wise men. I thought of it this week. If those wise men didn't see the star based upon what they discovered in the survey, those guys would still be wandering, still be going in circles. What's the picture? The picture is that the story of Bethlehem, the birth of Jesus, has a physical presence. God coming into the world in a physical presence. So when you and I look to Jesus, we look to the physical presence of God in our world. We're going to talk about that in the story of the shepherds this morning and how the shepherds began to realize what that meant to go to Bethlehem, leaving the fields to go to Bethlehem to see that Jesus and what it meant to them in a changed life. Let's talk a little bit about the shepherds this morning as we begin to walk through this. Who were the shepherds? Well, the shepherds were really ordinary, ordinary guys in one way. Just ordinary people who were out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks. Ordinary. They were actually less than ordinary. The shepherds weren't thought of too highly in the culture of the day. Uh, biblically, there's some thought that the shepherds were adored for what they stood for in terms of Christ as the Lamb of God and the whole sheep thing when it comes to 
Christ, our good shepherd, and so forth. But for the most part, shepherds were kind of outcasts in the society. In fact, if a shepherd wanted to go to the temple, let's say, for example, and wanted to worship, the shepherd would have to go through a seven-day cleansing period just to be able to worship. And on a shepherd's salary, you couldn't afford to miss one week of work just to go to church. So the picture was, and even the priests or the rabbis who came in contact with the shepherd before they went through the seven-day cleansing, they would have to go through a seven-day cleansing in order to be able to be with the shepherds who were cleansed in the temple. Sounds a little crazy, but that's the way it was. And so the picture of a shepherd was not a very good picture. But here's the interesting picture. When God chooses to give the story of the birth of his son to the world, he chooses shepherds. Shepherds. Ordinary people. Like, why not the mayor of Bethlehem? Or why not the religious people of the day? I mean, like the priests and the rabbis. Those people who knew that the Messiah was the promised one to come. No, God chose shepherds. Why? Because shepherds were probably the most ordinary people of the day going through the ordinary issues of the day. How about us? We're probably more than likely, I don't know all of you, I don't know your back, background, maybe some of you were very important wherever you were, I don't know. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it. But, but, the, but the picture is what? God says, I choose ordinary people in everyday situations to give my son to the world and to your life and mine. The story today is of these shepherds. Listen as we go back for a moment to the scriptures in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what the uh, angel said. The angel reassured them, that's the shepherds, do not be afraid. They were shepherds in the fields watching their flocks by night. We kind of know that story. We may be seeing the major scenes or we may be seeing children's programs, right? Children that probably the easiest costume in the Christmas story is the shepherd story. Just get a bathrobe, a sash, and a towel, wrap her on the head, and you got a costume, right, for the shepherds. And so the picture here is the angel comes, and the first thing the angel says to these ordinary people in ordinary life, shepherd life, was, don't be afraid. Maybe you remember about three weeks ago I told you we talked a little bit about Zechariah and Elizabeth and when the angel came and said, don't be afraid, that the phrase, don't be afraid or fear not, is mentioned 365 times in the scripture. Every day, God says, don't fear, no matter what you're going through, no matter what issue you're facing, no matter what's happening, you don't have to fear. God's with you. God will take care of you through death into eternity. Uh, I was a hospice chaplain for many, many years. Worked here in Casa Gran at the, uh, one of the hospices here in, in uh, Casa Gran and also in Mesa and back in California. And I have dealt with thousands and thousands of people actually in my years being a hospice chaplain besides pastoring. One of the things I would always tell people as they face that death experience is that you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. And for the Christians that I minister to, because Christ is with you, and he's there with you and for you in your life, don't have to be afraid. For the unbeliever, I'd have to tell them now not to be afraid. You know, the worst death that I've ever experienced in my hospice care was an unbeliever, was an unbeliever, a man who totally didn't believe in anything when it came to anything spiritual or the life hereafter. And I'm gonna tell you that he died the most miserable death I've ever seen anybody die. 
Why? Because he feared the end. He feared the unknown. You see, that's why we celebrate Christmas, because God says, you don't have to fear the unknown. I'm sending my son to be your savior in a tangible, physical way. So the angel gave to the shepherds the message of good news. Good news in Luke chapter 2, verse 10, the last part of that verse that I just read, I bring you good news that will be of great joy to all the people. Good news of great joy to all the people. We're hearing about the vaccine that's being shipped out on today around the nation. That's good news of great joy. But there is another good news of great joy, and that's the story of Jesus. Amen. Because the story of Jesus matches everything in our lives. Surprise. Everything in our lives. That's why he came to be our Lord and Savior. That's why he came to be a human being, to cry our tears, to laugh our laughter, to eat our food, to drink our drink, to feel our hurt, to feel our pain, to feel our elation, to feel our joy, to feel our celebration, to know that as we walk through this life, he has walked through this life. That's why the angel says, the Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, in Luke chapter 2, 11 and 12, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. And you'll recognize him by a sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in snugly strips of cloth, lying in a manger. He's the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. We'll talk more about that next week, what the angels were saying when they said those words. But here's the clue for the, for the uh, shepherds. You will find the baby wrapped in snugly cloth, strips of cloth, lying in the manger. But it said, here's the sign. The sign. That means this is the tangible reality of all that God has planned for his world in sending the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. He's a tangible, physical presence of God in this world. Why is that important? Because we, we forget that. That our message is no different than reading a horoscope. You know, I always tell people, I read my horoscope every day. I do, every day. I read that horoscope for, I don't know, I'm 70 years old. I suppose 50 years, I don't know, something like that probably, 40, 50 years. Do you know there's not been one day that I can apply that horoscope in my life? <laughs> I mean, odds are, odds are, you know, something would happen, right? Nothing. So I have fun reading it, because I know it's not going to happen that day if it's <laughs> something negative. I'm oh, good for a good day. Right? Well, the, the picture with you and I begin to see is that here comes real hope into a world. The story of Jesus is not an Aesop's fable. Amen. The story of Jesus is not a philosophical way to live. The story of Jesus is the real deal. Amen. You need to remember that at Christmas. We get caught up in all the stuff that happens at Christmas and the mythological stories of Santa and reindeer and snowmen and all that, Mr. Snowman, whatever that stuff is. Christ is the real deal because God wanted to tell us in a very specific way. Fear not. I have sent my son. He is your savior. So no matter what you go through, no matter what issue you deal with, now, tomorrow, the next day, next year, whatever it is, you know, I know, that we have a physical Jesus who came to be our savior, to love us with a never ending love. That gives us hope, and that gives us promise. That's why the scripture in chapter 2, 13 and 14 of the Gospel of Luke says the following, suddenly the angel was joined with a vast host of others, the armies of the heaven, praising God and saying, 
Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those whom God is pleased, with whom God is pleased. We'll talk about that next week, those great stories of the angel. But you know, God is still speaking today. God is still speaking in this Christmas. God is still speaking as if this Christmas was the first Christmas of the world. God is still speaking, not in the past, but so much as in the present, in your life and mine. God speaks to us today. God is here in the Word of God and the Word. God is here as He speaks to us through the songs that we sang. God is here today to us to speak to us in the gift of this day. God is here to speak to us in the power of His love that's there. But for us to understand it and the implication of it and the application of it, you and I have to do what the shepherds did. Luke chapter 2, verse 15. Angel returned to heaven. The shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Amen. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they go, and the scripture says, they go and they go to Bethlehem and they see Jesus and so forth. And then the scripture says, and they went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen it was just as the angel had told him. Let's go. And they went back. It's the story of Christianity. It's the story of your life and mine. Christianity is a faith in action. There's always faith in action. It is always living that life out for somebody else. It is always sacrificing. It is always giving. It is always encouraging. It is always telling. It is always showing the love of Jesus for the world. And if you forget that, you're going to have just the ordinary Christmas. The Christmas may not be any different than any other Christmas. But see, that's the challenge of the shepherds. Let's go to Bethlehem, it says. Let's see this thing that has happened. And when they were sought, they went back, glorifying and praising God. You know, in the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, 31st verse, the last chapter, last verse of the book of John, or close to it, John writes these words, but these things are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you'll have life by the power of His name. You see, that's what Scripture is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. That you and I might believe and confess and know the story of Jesus for our lives. What does it take to really celebrate Christmas? To really understand what Christmas is all about? It takes the intentional step of faith. Not just believing, but acting in that faith living that life out. Three things to remember from the story of the shepherds about how you and I can live the life out. First one is to find Jesus. To find Jesus. And maybe you've confessed Christ as Savior in your life. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you need to confess Christ for the first time in your life. I invite you to do that today. In a moment in our prayer. Maybe you've taken Christ for granted in your life. Maybe there's another, this is another Christmas where it's not the same. Yeah? And it's not the same, is it, because of COVID. You know, we used to take journeys to Grandma's house, or to the mall, or to see family and friends. We're on the phone last night with our daughter. Our family's coming for Christmas. All four of the kids will be there. Three of them of them that come from California. Daughter said, but dad's 70 and there's COVID. What if we bring the disease? Not the same. Not quite the same, is it? But God is above it. 
God is greater and God will take us through whatever we got to go through. Amen. When you find Jesus, when you really find Jesus and realize he's here with you and me, then whatever happens, happens. Whatever struggle there is a struggle. Whoever you are, whatever you're going through, you and I can know that we have a Jesus. That's Luke chapter 2, 15 and 16. Let me read it again. So when the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. I would encourage you to find your focus on Jesus in the next few weeks. Maybe take your Bible out and read the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew and the first two chapters which deal with the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Maybe put Christmas music on and let, let that play all day long in your home or in your car, whatever it might be. Attend worship, be faithful in whatever you can to find Jesus. Maybe put that major scene in a place where you'll see it every day. The story of Jesus. You see, find Jesus anew in this Christmas season. Second thing that you and I begin to understand from the shepherds is that we need to be a telling people. Tell others about Jesus. You know, one of the joys I have this time of year is to wish people a Merry Christmas. Yeah, amen. I love going through fries. <laughs> you know, pay my groceries and say, Merry Christmas. Uh, or whatever it might be. You don't know, have to be so socially correct or whatever anymore. I don't believe in that. Anyway, I almost said a bad word. The whole all I did is that, that we, uh, we say Merry Christmas because that's what it is. Keep Christ in Christmas. Place Christ in Christmas because he is Christmas. In our worship, send Christmas cards. You know, I got a Christmas card this morning from my uh, paper boy. Worst card I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Worst card. It had happy holidays with a cat sleeping. I don't know what that means at all. He wanted five bucks. <laughs> What's the picture? I mean, that's the world. I, mean, I laugh at the world. I mean, the world is like crazy when it comes this time of year. Trying to celebrate, trying to find happiness, trying to focus on something. When here, all you got to focus on is Jesus. Amen. And the story of his love that's there Amen. for you and me. Text people. If you're in the texting, text Christmas, text <coughs> Christmas, text Christmas, and then hit share wherever you can, however you do that. Or if you Twitter, twit it. <laughs> I don't know what you do with that stuff. I don't know that either. But that's the picture. Share Christ. Tell others. Uh, your families, whatever it might be. Just focus on Jesus. That's what Luke 17, 18 says. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. And the third thing that you and I need to remember about these shepherds is that something happened to them. They appeared to have a changed life. Scripture says in Luke chapter 2, verse 20, And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen. It was just at the, as the angel had told them. The shepherds returned to their flock. What does that tell us? It tells us that when the shepherds went back, they went back to their ordinary life. They went back to their problems. They went back to the sheep. They went back to taking care of it. They went back to everyday life. But something was different. It was Jesus. And they were changed. 
And of all the things that you and I can think about of Christmas, that Christmas is a call to change. Christmas is a call for all of us to think of our life in a different way, to come out of the ordinary into the extraordinary, in the power of God's love for us in His Son, and how you and I can live it out in our lives. I don't know what you might need to confess this morning to draw closer to Jesus. I don't know what you need to do with your belief and faith in Him this morning. But I do know that you and I are in the same boat when it comes to living that life out. We need to see the action of the shepherds to go and tell, to live that life out, to see our life as a changed life. In fact, I believe that what COVID has done to the world is God's call to see life differently. Amen. To see the brevity of life, the shortness of life, to be able to see we need something stronger to hang on to. Amen. We need something greater to motivate us. We need something more powerful to help us live in this life. I think COVID and every Christmas actually is a call to something different. It might be a call for some of us to move away from something wrong, to stop making excuses, to stop rationalizing certain things in our life, and to be able to honestly follow the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. Maybe this Christmas is a call for you to mend a relationship with somebody else, to make a phone call, to send a letter, to send a card, to talk to somebody. Maybe this Christmas for something different is to help someone you know is in need. To take that step of faith and reach out to them. Even people who we don't know in this life. Maybe it's to stop living in the past and start living in the present. Maybe it's a time to simply live with a believing heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe this Christmas, like the shepherds, first Christmas, is to do something bold, to do something for somebody else, to give something, to begin something new, to go and tell somebody about Jesus. You see, Christmas is a call to action is a call to take a step forward. For the little story, I don't know if it's true or not, about a little boy who was talking to his grandpa in biblical days. And he said, Grandpa, he said, I heard you were a shepherd. And uh, grandpa said, yeah, I was a shepherd older now, but I was a shepherd. The little boy said, Grandpa, did you hear the story about those shepherds that saw the angel and heard about Jesus? The old shepherd said, yeah, I heard about the story. And the little boy said, well, what do you think about that story, Grandpa? What do you think about those shepherds? And the grandpa said, I was there. I saw the angels. We were there together, the other shepherds and me. And the little boy said, well, grandpa, what happened? What'd you do? And grandpa said, I stayed in the field. I didn't go. But they did. And 
they went and they came back and now my life has changed. That's Christmas. Go to Bethlehem, meet Jesus again, celebrate his love in your heart and life, take it to others, tell others, and live it out. You see, Christmas is a chance in all of our lives to make the next step, intentional step, to follow him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love for each one of us today. Lord Jesus, we celebrate this Christmas season. Help us to celebrate your presence and your love that's there for us. May our lives be changed today, O oh Lord, in such a way that we receive you as Lord and Savior once again, renew our confidence in you, or for the first time, pledge our life to you, Lord Jesus, and seek you as the Savior of our lives. Amen. Help us, O oh Lord, to have a changed life and a changed Christmas as we seek your love and walk in it each day. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. 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 Have a great day.